Good morning, Charles. How are you doing today? Beautifully, thank you. I, I got to tell you, dude, if this were the Johnny Depp trial, you are my star witness because I got to put you on the stand. Man, you have information in this book that, that the jury needs to find out what is going on so that we can ha finally bring a conclusion to this case. It, it, and my book does. And, and, and uh, you know, I had, uh, oh, as the book explains, I had over 56 homicides that I handled in my career as a, as the chief of homicide for the st uh, state of Delaware. And uh, I throw in some, uh, uh, to make a point about a legal point, for example, I'll, I'll explain about a, one of the cases I handled, one of the mafia cases that I, uh, excuse me, one of the uh, uh, many uh, homicide cases that I handled. Mm -hmm as chief of the office. When when so, you, when you dig in deep like this though Charles, I mean I mean my god, you got to be looking over your shoulder because I mean you you are really good at digging. Well, I was uh, I I made my mark as an interrogator at a time when you could interrogate. Mm. The, the Supreme Court has watered down the ability to interrogate. Uh, a classic example that I cite is the O.J. Simpson uh, white Bronco ride that he took uh, when he knew it, it was over. He knew he was caught, defeated, and about to go down for a double homicide. Mm -hmm. And he had a he had a buddy of his from the old football days uh, taking him to an airport. He had his passport. He had a wig. And he had a gun. And a couple of times he put the gun in his mouth to show the, the cops that were following him that, that he had that gun. And uh, when he arrived at his home and stepped out of his white Bronco, the police on the ground under Earl Warren's laws were not allowed to ask him a single question wow. because he had a lawyer. And that ridiculous rule that count as I entered Brooklyn Law School in 1966, that rule had just come out. I worked in the library and the, uh, the library was jammed with professors who wanted a copy of the new rule, the Miranda rules. And uh, they were as baffled by it as, as anyone. And when I got my job in, in the Delaware Attorney General's office as the chief of homicide, it was a job that uh, my very terrific boss, Attorney General Laird Stabler, he created the job when he hired me. He wanted me to go to every um, crime scene that had a murder and make sure that the police didn't fail to uh, didn't fail to do something something technical mm -hmm. that needed to be done, and and the whole case get thrown out. And they were throwing out cases back then in, uh, you know, 1960, 61, 62. And, and I was, uh, in East Harlem, I was a New York City welfare investigator. And I saw it happen right before my eyes. I saw the drug explosion occur. In, in my day, if you wanted drugs, you would have to go to 100th Street in East Harlem, uh, one block, and it was the one block that the that the police allowed the 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 sale of marijuana and uh, heroin with the drugs of the day. Um, but uh, it, it blossomed and grew and grew from those days to what we have now, uh, where fentanyl is being brought in the yep. uh, into our country and our kids are being exposed to it. Yeah, they, they, just the other day. I and mean, it's all the it's it's all the result of the Warren Court. Okay, and I explain that too because it's an important way to understand the mafia mm -hmm. and the mafia's role in the JFK assassination. It's one of the seven mysteries of the world. This this uh the the, the JFK assassination. Except I always call it the execution because I mean it 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 it, it was brutal. And and we watch those films over and over again, and we all try to piece it together. And that's why I love this book because you 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 give us the opportunity to find focus and and not rely on on seven second uh, video clips and things like that. 
Yeah, and, and also amateurs. I mean, no offense to those wonderful writers who kept the story alive. They knew something was wrong with the investigation. They just didn't have a under, professional understanding of, of uh, the deviousness of Earl Warren and the uh, plotting of uh, Lyndon Johnson and the plotting of Bobby Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a, if you're old enough to remember the funeral, it was one of the saddest things. And I'm Italian, so we cry at the drop of a hat. <laughs> My mother's house was full of people crying. Mm -hmm. uh, Carolina DiMarco, they didn't come to America for this crap. And, uh, and uh, excuse me, I have to get another Kleenex. <laughs> and, um, and I realized in, in handling and in investigating it as I would any uh, murder case, and as I did many murder cases, handling it that way, at the way a professional would handle it, it's an easy case. It didn't need to be a muddle. It didn't need to have well-meaning writers trying to figure it out. It was, uh, it was so handleable, it isn't funny. The book we're talking about is Suppressing the Truth in Dallas, you know what? What one of the the touch, touching things here about this book is is that millennials and Generation Zers do not know who Chief Justice Earl Warren is, and and you say, look, I need to share this with you because beyond our generation, they're they're going to forget about this moment, and and they can't, they can't, they can't, and I and and I truly, if you, if you believe what I say here now, as a as a uh, an accomplished. <laughs> A lawyer, apart from, from the homicides, I also was a, a medical malpractice lawyer mm. and brought, brought home giant verdicts in a very successful career after I left the homicide career. And my last homicide was the, the uh, I, I defended some homicides as well. And the last one that I handled was the, uh, the head of the pagan motorcycle gang uh, was arrested for killing two witnesses and and leaving their bodies in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know my my experience went both ways. And every once in a while I'll get a wise guy who who wants to challenge me, and I just say, well, how many shoplifting cases did you handle? Because I know you <laughs> never handled a murder case. <laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson. Did he have the nation fooled? Because there are so many stories about this man from Texas, and 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 it's almost like that that there there was no plot. But what 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 happened with the Bay of Pigs that that could have led to something? Oh, I I analyzed it as one of my proudest moments when I figured out the Bay of Pigs invasion, and uh, you know it was. I, I can't tell you in a in a little radio interview that's going to end in 20 minutes, maybe. <laughs> but, but the book, the book lays it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, every detail, chapter and verse. And that uh, most authors, uh, almost all, all authors, but me, let's put it that way. Uh, look at the Bay of Pigs invasion and, and blame JFK for not having the courage to provide air support for the Cuban exiles on the shore in, uh, in Cuba, in Havana. Uh, and yes, he did not order uh, an air cover for the Cuban exiles. Mm -hmm. But I analyze it step by step of what happened and what it all means. And it, it means that they had another plan. And I, I show that plan completely, fully, and I, uh, is, uh, there's no question but that I would have won the case quickly if, if I took it to trial as a homicide investigator in those days. You, your style of writing... Your style of writing, uh, I defrag and things like, for instance, like what I love about your book is that I, I defrag it. In other words, I take notes and I sit there and I go, if I were there, what would I do? It's it's almost like you're giving us this story to put in our own mind and heart to figure it out on the spot as we're reading it. Thank you. And that was a, as a homicide investigator and jury trial lawyer. That was my job. It's what I did for a living. They gave me a paltry paycheck. Uh, 15,000 a year, but that's what I did. Wow. 
and uh, I appreciate your your picking up on it. I got to know who Carla. That's my goal is to let the, let the country pick up on it. Well, and it's going to create conversation. So I, I'm not going to be shocked if if uh, 60 Minutes doesn't grab your hand and says you you need to talk to us, Charles. What 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 do you know that we have not known about? Because our our main guy, you know, sat there and said, "Well, the president has been shot." I mean, and now it's time to get the real story here. Yeah, this is the real story, and it's uh, it's not a long book, so. It would make a good 60 minute segment, I'm sure. Uh, but um, I'm very confident that it's that it's going to be, become the standard history. Yeah, yeah. Well, and don't you think also- as my as, as my last book on on uh, the Hoffa murder? Yes, by, yes. by the Irishman. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, where where do you get the confidence and the courage to step into these moments where where you? I mean, it's it's, it's like you know it, Ho, Jimmy Hoffa as well as JFK and stuff like that. Because I mean, most people like to run away from history. You're going, no, I'm facing the fire. I'm going, I'm going in there. Well, I I did mention I think that I was raised Italian in New right. York City. Yes. <laughs> I think that I think that answers that one. <laughs> we're we're not exactly known. For running away from trouble, <laughs> Carlos Marcello. I mean, th- this is a name that I, until I read your book, I I didn't know Carlos. But you give us that opportunity. Yeah, he's. And and when I I put in the book that I had a eureka moment, and I ran to my notes, my research notes, to look for for a date that I needed in my writing, and there it was waiting for me. Mm. And I immediately knew that this is what got this information here is what got JFK killed. Mm. And I show that and it's unassailable. I mean, there's no there's no way around it. This is the real McCoy. This is not some fancy idea that I had. So let's I'm still in touch with my uh, my old homicide investigators. You want to hear an anecdote? Absolutely. All right. So I was at home in, in Sun Valley, Idaho, where I live. And uh, I got a call from uh, a, a former uh, head of the, the Wilmington, Delaware uh, uh, homicide squad. I, we worked many a case together. His name is Stan Friedman. And uh, Stan is a, a, an ex-Marine and he was in charge of the, the Wilmington, Delaware Police Department's homicide squad. And um, Stan was on his way to a reunion of Wilmington policemen with his wife, Alma, and he called me. We just shot the breeze and every once in a while we'll, we'll reminisce about uh, various murderers that we handled. And uh, when it was about time to, to, for him to pay attention to his driving so that he could get up the Jersey Turnpike to, uh, to the reunion, uh, I said to him, Stan, if you run into any people from my era uh, at the reunion, say hi to me. <laughs> I, still miss, I still miss that work. And Stan said, I will. And I said, well, it was from... Uh, 1971 to 1976. And Stan said, wait a minute, Charlie. Are you trying to tell me that you were only in the office for five years? And and I said, well, it was actually six years, Stan. And Stan said, if I had to guess, I'd have said 20 years, all the shit you did. <laughs> and that's the best compliment I ever got from my <laughs> my homicide work. <laughs> You know, with, with with all of your connections and understanding family, we'll call it family, not necessarily mafia, but family. I mean, uh, John Gotti was the Teflon Don. Do we are we not living that right now with with the former president? Is that it, somebody is convinced that they are the the Teflon Don? I don't know who you, what you're talking about. It sounds political, and I, I try to stay away from politics. All right, let's let, let's don't go there then, because I mean, because I mean, the, the uh, we'll just we'll focus on John Gotti. It's it's like that. That to me is also yeah, I, a story that I, I wish that you would dig into. Well, you you sound just just like my um, my agent. <laughs> when I when I showed him my first draft, he said, "Charlie, it lacks focus," 
And I realized, you know, I have so many war stories that I could just stop anywhere and tell you an anecdote, you know, and uh, maybe I will right now. We had a, uh, a young girl, a beautiful girl, a model, wannabe model, who stopped at a Chinese restaurant in Wilmington for uh, her lunch to bring home to her desk, and she disappeared. It turned out she, would, she had been put into a suitcase in body parts mm -hmm. uh, by a, an employee of that Chinese restaurant named Cheng Wo Wa. He had jumped ship from uh, uh, China, and uh, this was uh, you know 1970, let's say, and he uh, uh, he did he obviously did this to this girl. Uh, when he was found by Wilmington police, he had uh, blood and hair on his shoes, mm. and it was you know it was just gruesome, and. Earl Warren and his Supreme Court in 1972 had just eliminated our right to have a death penalty if we wanted one as a, as a people, state by state. Every state had a death penalty except, I think, Michigan. And uh, that was because that was that's what the people wanted. And uh, now, what are, now what are they going to do? They've got this man who doesn't speak a word of English, and he jumped ship. And there's no death penalty anymore. Mm. And so my superiors, this wasn't one of my cases, but it's a good story. My superiors in the attorney general's office and the higher ups like Stan Friedman in the uh, Wilmington Police Department uh, deported him. They brought him to Chinese authorities and handed him over and they executed him for the crime of jumping ship. You may remember that communists were not allowed, they didn't allow people to leave the country and still don't. And uh, that's how, that's how Chang Wo Wa was handled. Mm. Mm. And interesting, isn't it? It is. Every, everything about you is very interesting. And as, as you release these stories from your personal experiences, it's got to open the door for you to, to experience newer things. Is, has there been something that, that it's like, wow, if, now that I've let this go, I'm doing this now. Well, I, you know, at 80, <laughs> you, you accumulate a lot of stories yes. in my field, you know, and my related field. I was also a renowned medical malpractice trial lawyer where I, I would bring home verdicts in the, in the millions wow. Wow. before I retired from that. And, and some of them are fa fascinating in the sense that a hospital tries to fix a case so that they ha try to hide evidence. Yep. And so it becomes a bit of a mystery. And uh, I handle, uh, I was the, I was the guy. <laughs> I was the guy that handled it and was voted every year as the top uh, medical malpractice lawyer in my jurisdiction. What a story. Charles, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. I want to hear more and more of your stories. Got him. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Step right up, my war story, and that's why how I, how my agent said me, "You're losing focus, Charlie." Hey, hey, Arrow! If you guys want, and, and we we can you can go a little bit longer because we have a break now until uh, ten thirty five or so. So if it's our, you know, if you guys can do it, are you okay? trying to stop me? <laughs> <laughs> My wife will tell, will tell you you're wasting your time trying to stop this windbag. <laughs> so so we're, we're newly we're newlyweds, forty seven years. Wow, are you? Wow. See, I I'm at thirty. I there, there's just something about a relationship like that that really gives you strength in not only your personal life but your career life as well. You you need those forty seven years to continue being what you do that you do every day. I couldn't do any of it without her. Yep. 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 Wow. So now where, where did this investigative side come from you? It, it, was it planted by somebody in your family or was it the fact that you just love mysteries? Well, that's a good question. And, uh, uh, I, w I worked as a, as a uh, welfare department investigator in East Harlem 
And East Harlem at that time was controlled by the Genovese crime family. Oh, yeah. And uh, in, the, in the movie version of, of my uh, prior book, uh, I Heard You Paint Houses, uh, The Irishman, uh, they show the, uh, the the mob in charge of East Harlem. They they show uh, uh, Fat Tony Salerno's uh, so-called social club, but but headquarters, and some important meetings that occurred there about Hoffa, with with Russell Buffalino, the crime boss of of uh, rural Pen of Pennsylvania, and uh, in these meetings. And, and those meetings really happened. And they happened the way they, they're portrayed in the book. They were portrayed that way in the movie. I had the privilege of working on the movie with Scorsese, De Niro, and, and uh, the great screenwriter, Steve Zalian. And I, I, I handled uh, a lot of material for them mm. to try to get at the, the exact truth. So there was not, nothing in that movie that is hyperbola nothing in that movie that is overblown and there's no reason to when you have the, the kind of material that i have in my head you know it was a wonderful experience working with those people well as as a, a viewer it was a wonderful experience to spend my thanksgiving day watching all four hours of of that presentation and to see that we're oh, right good here. man oh my god dude you have no idea that that i was so drawn to that story and and then to you know to be talking with you about about you, I mean, it, w without you, there there may, may have never been words because they needed what you experienced and what you researched in order to put that up there. Yeah. Now they uh, and and the um, the prime mover was uh, was Robert De Niro. If it were not for him, the movie would have never been made. He fell in love with the character of, of Frank the Irishman Sharon, and he became determined to play him on the screen. How he didn't win an Oscar, I'll never know. Mm. But it's politics. Well, it was time for Koreans to win an Oscar. Not not only that, but there was also a battle that was going on that this was this was on television and not on the big screen. And 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 that war, you know, continues to grow today. Thank God they're finally letting these these presentations on the Netflixes and the Hulus and stuff like that get awards. But that but but the thing is though, is that your participation with this project opened the door for what we're seeing right now, which is movies being streamed on television. Yeah. It it, it helped do that for sure. To be, and they, they were wonderful people. I mean, they're not, you know, the, they're just it was a, it was a, it's been and continues to be an amazing experience. And then to follow up that book uh, on on Hoffa and from the the in, interrogations I did of the principal uh, suspect in the Hoffa disappearance, and um, there was a guy going around trying to claim on TV that he had, he knew where the body was yes. and he would, he would get somebody to dig another hole. <laughs> I don't know how many holes they dug, <laughs> but we didn't pay attention to them. <laughs> and as Frank Sheeran said, he was still alive at the time. He said to me, if, if, uh, uh, if, if they had buried Hoffa, they, they actually incent used what Frank Sheeran in his accent called an incinerary. Mm. They used an incinerary. If they had instead buried him, uh, Frank Sheeran assured me he'd have been found by now. Right. There's, there's no way to bury somebody as prominent as that uh, without getting caught and without getting informants coming in with, with the truth true stories instead of the BS that appeared on TV. <laughs> Now, Charles, do you feel like, after you've experienced it, do you feel like the journalist, the storyteller, or the archaeologist? Do I feel like the journalist or what, sir? The, a journalist, a storyteller, or an archaeologist? Because, I mean, I, you, you fit so well into every one of those descriptions because you, you are bringing history back to us. It's almost like you went out there, you dug up the ground, you found the truth, you're bringing it to us. Well, I want to brag a little, but you know, uh, Michael Bodden, the uh, former medical examiner for the city of New York, who appears a, as an expert on TV a lot in, in medical examining. You, you know of him, Mike Bodden? Mm -mm. No? 
Hmm. Anyway, he's a famous uh, forensic pathologist. He was used in, in all the major cases. And, um, and of course, he was used in the uh, uh, JFK uh, revisit. The JFK case was revisited in the late 70s for a brief cup of coffee. And, and they found out some things that I found useful for my book, for my uh, JFK book, my Dallas book. And um, anyway, he, he was impressed with how well written it was. <laughs> and I appreciated that as much as I appreciated it being impressed that I solved it, you know. When, and, and I had already, already solved the Hoffa mystery. Right. So, and, and I, 50, as I said, 56 uh, cases that I handled, murder cases that I handled. Mm. And in a day when you could interrogate. Right. You know, interrogation was watered down and destroyed, basically, by Earl Warren. Did that change you in, in, in the everyday world in the way that uh, if you couldn't interrogate, how am I supposed to have a conversation with somebody? In, in, or are, you think I'm interrogating you? No, I'm, I just want to ask a simple question. Did it change you as a, as a regular person? Not really. It, it, um, as, a, as a regular person, as a citizen, you mean? Yeah, right? of course. Because I mean, because so well, many times it, we're it, all consumed the, the by rule, our career. The Earl Warren rules I exposed – but it's it's kind of dry. I exposed in a Reader's Digest article uh, in 1990. I've been I've been going after these rules that handcuff police for a long time. I just lost a, a second cousin to fentanyl in uh, in the South, and she uh, she was a young girl, and and the police. Ever since Giuliani left the left the city of New York, mm -hmm. the police remain handcuffed, and they and those cases of Earl Warrens are responsible for the drug problem in America. I got an unsolicited letter from uh, uh, then President Reagan. This was in maybe the eighties, and he wrote me a letter. He had just read a book of mine called "The Right to Remain Silent." And that book exposes how the poli how police work was changed uh, overnight by Earl Warren. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And that's how I ended up having a career because I applied for a, a deputy attorney general's job in the Delaware uh, attorney general's office. And the attorney general said to me, I have a special job for you because you've, you've lived, you, you have had a normal life. I was a forklift operator at the Chrysler plant. I was an, uh, uh, a welfare department investigator. I was a school teacher. Wherever I could grab a quick buck, I worked, you know. And he said, I like your, your vast experience. And I, I, as opposed to somebody fresh out of law school, right. who, who's more of a bookish person, mm -hmm. you've been in the real world. And what I want you to do is come to work not just as a as a homicide prosecutor but i want you to come to our office as a homicide investigator where the police have your phone number all the detectives the, the homicide squads and they call you whenever there's a homicide whenever there's a body found and it, and at the time it was a job that paid 15,000 a year and i had to use my own dodge dart <laughs> standard transmission because it was 150 dollars cheaper oh my god <laughs> and the cops that i worked with fell in love with me <laughs> and i fell in love with them and we're still in touch well the, the cops die people don't realize that uh, uh, cops die young yes uh, second second only to to firemen wow. and minors comes third but cops die young. And I lost a lot of very talented, very wonderful people in my uh, life to cops. How do you deal with that personally? Because and, and, and the reason why I'm so glad that you brought that up, because I have a very close friend that became the photographer at a lot of murder scenes. My friend became literally insane 
because it, it affected him emotionally, personally, as well as spiritually. You get this close to a murder case. How are you so strong, Charles? Well, you do what the, what the ones before you who were on the scene with you, you just imitate. Mm. So I, I, I went up to a very uh, renowned local Wilmington detective named Charlie Burke, and he had just gotten a confession. Despite the rules that make it hard, he had just gotten a confession to a, a, a murder case where a guy named Randolph Dickerson, a heroin addict, had climbed down the, the um, uh, fire escape in an apartment to use his uh, uh, Jimmy as a Jimmy, his, his screwdriver, and break into the apartment and rifle the drawers of a woman, uh, a black woman who sold uh, Bibles as, as a living. That's how she supported herself. She went around door to door selling Bibles. And it became the Bible sales lady case. And she surprised Randolph coming home early and uh, surprised him going through her drawer. Mm. And he stabbed her to death with the uh, screwdriver. And Charlie Burke managed to get a confession out of him. And I said, I said to Charlie and to his then boss, Stan Friedman, Charlie's now gone, but uh, Stan Friedman's still uh, more than around. We're in touch weekly. And um, Stash, we used to call him, which is Polish for Stanley. He wasn't Polish, by the way. Hmm. But anyway, uh, uh, we're in touch a lot. And and he, um, he and Charlie almost at the same time said these prophetic words to me. I'm going to use Charlie Burke's Delaware accent. They want to tell you, Chal. <laughs> they want to tell you. <laughs> they want to tell you. And I thought to myself, I was brand new. It wasn't my case, the Dickerson case. It was the case of the uh, of one of the bosses. And... Um, and I thought to myself, yeah, if you lean on them, I guess they want to tell you. Because I knew that side of things, too, growing up Italian in New York City. The police leaned on us. If there was a fight on the corner, two guys having a fist fight, and the cops rolled up, everyone would have to get up against the wall. Yep. Remove their handkerchief from their back pocket. We all carried hankies in those days spread it out on the asphalt and then empty all empty our pockets and fill the uh, the um, the handkerchief with whatever was in our pockets yep. so we know never to have uh, a a blade longer than six inches because that was against the law yep. we definitely knew in new york in those days to have no guns now that they, they did have zip guns but they were used for a specific purpose. But you did not have a real gun because you they would throw the book at you. And there was no such thing as a bad search. There was no such thing as lawyering up. I hear that and I want to go bananas. <laughs> and, and I figured out ways for myself to get around these rules. And as, as the uh, chief deputy, I knew how to do it, wow. Wow. and and I did it. And if I crossed the line, that was up to a higher court to, to throw my case out. But I knew they wouldn't because I knew how I handled it from the moment I arrived at the at the murder scene. How I handled it. Wow. I'll give you an example. Um, a uh, a murderer, essentially, although. The, the police that the policeman that was shot did, wasn't actually wasn't killed. He was almost killed. It was attempted murder. He was working what they call a pay job, where he gets paid on the side for for security work, and he was doing security for a jack in the box. He heard some noise by the dumpsters, and he came out to take a look, and a guy uh, a guy who was there to rob the the jack in the box 
had a 22 rifle hmm. and and shot the the uh, the police officer in the head uh, fortunately it was a 22 and not something more serious and uh, and that was my case obviously I was chief of the office and and they didn't know who did it you know it was it was done at night and uh, I began investigating and and found the guy we found that we focused on a guy that had just uh, skipped sentencing on another case of his and uh, he had he was, he was going to get a five-year sentence and instead of arresting him for the murder I had him arrested on that warrant that outstanding warrant which allowed me to spend more time with him than I otherwise would have been allowed to do and uh, and I I I, inv- I was the king of interrogation. <laughs> oh, my God, Charles. I taught, I, it, to, I taught it to the cops. Uh, it's a gift. It is. And, it is. And it's been a gift. It, to, you'll, it, you'll meet an interrogator in my book, the Dallas Police Department's Championship Interrogator uh, by the name of Captain Will Fritz. And um, the... the, the um, uh, the, the, the feds, the, the, the Federal Warren Commission elbowed the, the Dallas police out of the case. Uh, and um, But it was a Dallas case. It was not a, a federal case. In those days, there was no such thing as the crime of murdering a, a president. Or the, in fact, the, the, uh, the, the FBI had no jurisdiction. And uh, they just elbowed their way in. Wow. And they did it because they knew that the the investigation into this president's murder could lead to the exposure of some very high ups. Wow. Very good, very good uh, friends of theirs. I expose every one of them. I love it. I love it. In the first in the the first chapter, I expose six of them. (laughs) I name them. You know, I love it. I name names. Well, they've got to get the book. They've got to get the book. Charles, I've been blessed to have this conversation with you today. And I know we're going to meet again because, like I said, I want these stories. And I know that, you know, we we just got to get more time to where we can sit here and document all of the stuff that's inside your heart. Please come back to the show. You're in Connecticut. You're in Connecticut, right? I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's the East Coast. How about if we just say that it's on the East Coast? We're all connected. <laughs> yeah, I have I have I have family in um, South Carolina. Oh, beautiful. Uh, they they got off the boat in 1911 from Italy, and uh, I've got these cousins that have white skin, freckles, red hair, with the last name DeMarco. Oh, there you go, there you go. No. Well, you be brilliant today, okay, sir? And, Bill, I apologize for going exceeding the limits, man. No, that's fine. It was so interesting. Definitely. No, no, not an issue. Oh, I love Charles. He's got to come back. He's got to come back. <laughs> I'm, I'm your man. Thank you. I'll bring him back. Thank you so much, guys. Talk to you later, Arrow. You bet. Bye, I guys. want to say one thing. Thanks, thanks to whoever has read the book because it's a book that begs to be read, cries out to be read from start to finish. It isn't a book you can skim. And I tell people it's like a Charlie Chan book, <laughs> where at the, at the end of the book everybody's brought into the into the drawing room, and Charlie reviews the case item by item by item, so, and uh, every single detail matters as if you were the jury, and I was the prosecuting attorney with fifty six homicides to my credit, and when I left the office, I had four men on death row. Now they didn't. They weren't hung, although that was the, the prescribed. Uh, they were sentenced to hang, but uh, Sup- the Earl Warren Supreme Court did away with our right to have a death penalty if we wanted one. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, sir. Until next time, be brilliant, okay? Okay.